Welcome back to lecture number 55. This is the start of a new historical period. Period 6 is going to take us from 1865 to 1898, and this first lecture is meant to provide context for everything that happened. The learning objective is explain the historical context for the rise of industrial capitalism in the United States. The rise of industrial capitalism is going to be one of the biggest developments of period 6, and it's going to affect various other parts of society. The first key concept says technological advances, large-scale production methods, and the opening of new markets encouraged the rise of industrial capitalism in the United States. This answers the learning objective as directly as possible. One of the biggest technological developments of the period that has a larger impact on various industries is the Bessemer process. This was a better and cheaper way to make steel. Steel drove this industrial expansion with the construction of railroads and factories. The opening of new markets refers to the markets in the west of the United States. A transcontinental railroad was completed in 1869, and markets between California to the Midwest and the East Coast are all now connected. It speeds up the ability to purchase and transport goods, and that leads to people purchasing more goods, and subsequently, economic expansion. There are also more people buying products overseas. The United States leans on Japan to open itself to outside trade so that the American producers can sell more of their goods. American businessmen had similarly ventured into Hawaii to grow products that Americans would buy. Their quest to maintain a profitable trading relationship with the U.S. resulted in the overthrow of the Hawaiian monarchy and annexation of Hawaii by the U.S. This new era of industrialization is characterized by large businesses with mega-rich owners. Depending on who is describing them, they might be referred to as captains of industry or robber barons. Captains of industry credit them for their leadership in expanding the U.S. economy, while robber barons criticize them for making their fortunes on the backs of the poor working class. Examples of these are Andrew Carnegie in the steel industry, J.D. Rockefeller in oil, and J.P. Morgan in banking. The political cartoon on the bottom right of the screen definitely takes on a negative view of them as robber barons while they sit on bags of money and their barge at sea is held up by the workers. The next key concept says, Large-scale industrial production accompanied by massive technological change, expanding international communication networks, and a pro-growth government policies generated rapid economic development and business consolidation. Similarly to the first industrialization period in the 19th century, technological innovations drove the industrial expansion. In the last slide, we mentioned the Bessemer process, but other important technological advancements include the use of electricity, the telephone, elevators, even consumer cameras. International communication also grew incredibly faster when a transatlantic telegraph cable was successfully established in 1866, reducing the time it took to communicate with someone in Europe from two weeks to two minutes. Pro-growth government policies included government contracts given to private companies, like the ones to build railroads or supply American Indian reservations. Government subsidies were given to railroads in the form of land grants, and the absence of corporate regulation in itself could be considered a pro-business policy. Economic development is going to be very widespread in the North, as it is where most of the manufacturing and industrial centers were located after the Civil War. The map on the slide shows the wealth in the United States in 1872. The darker yellow areas are more wealthy, and the lighter areas are less wealthy. The South was still struggling during and after the Civil War and Reconstruction. There were proponents for a new South to bring the South into this industrialization age, but it didn't quite work. Business consolidation means that companies are getting larger through buying and merging with competitors making monopolies. In the steel industry, the oil industry, and the railroad industry, there are monopolies and they're able to consolidate through the process of vertical and horizontal integration. In vertical integration, they control every step of the process of making one product, while in horizontal integration, they are able to control the entire market share for one product or one industry by buying up other competitors. The next key concept says, a variety of perspectives on the economy and labor developed during a time of financial panics and downturns. The economy in the late 19th century generally worked to benefit the people in the urban areas, primarily entrepreneurs and factory owners, but real wages for workers also increased during this time period. Farmers and people living in rural areas were in the less desirable position. Farmers took on large debt to expand their planting acreage or update their farm equipment to keep up with competition. The technological improvements in farming led to higher crop yields, and with a higher supply of crops sold at market, prices fall. Farmers increasingly took on more debt and were less able to pay it back. Deflation meant that the value of the dollar was more valuable because there was less of it in the economy. Farmers, therefore, advocated for an inflationary policy, which meant that they wanted more money to be put into the money supply, and thus the value would go down, making it easy for them to pay back their debts. They proposed doing this by coining silver in addition to gold and using paper notes or greenbacks not backed by gold or silver. 
Greenbacks had been used in the Civil War to quickly pay for war materials, but once the war ended, the U.S. shifted away from the use of greenbacks. While this policy would have helped farmers with large debts, it was opposed by those who already had a lot of money because it would decrease the value of the money they already had. Labor refers to those working in industrial factories for hourly wages. Conditions in factories were generally difficult and sometimes unsafe. The standard working day was 12 hours long and worked for 6 days a week. The wages were generally low, but cost of living consistently went down through the end of the 19th century. New labor unions began to mobilize on a national scale to advocate for the interest of workers and advocate shortening working hours, safer conditions, and higher pay. The first example of this is the National Labor Union. The Knights of Labor were the next major union, and they accepted all types of workers across various industries, skilled, unskilled, men, women, white, or black. They began to lose members after violence and an explosion at a large strike in Chicago, the Haymarket Square Strike. The American Federation of Labor takes over as the largest labor union after the Knights of Labor, and it's still around today in the form of the AFL-CIO. They are, as the name suggests, a federation of labor unions. That means that it's not individuals who join, but it's various labor unions that join this larger federation of unions. For financial panics, there are two really big ones in 1873 and 1893. Panics in this time are going to be caused by over-speculation on land and railroad company stocks. As people believe that the value of these two will endlessly go up, they create bubbles, and when the bubbles burst, people lose on their investment, which negatively affects the economy. The next key concept says, New systems of production and transportation enabled consolidation within agriculture, which along with periods of instability spurred a variety of responses from farmers. The mechanization of farming makes it faster to plant and harvest crops, leading to farmers expanding the size of their plots. It also becomes more expensive to be a farmer as they have to buy more land and new machinery to compete with the growing commercial farms, and it leads to growing indebtedness. As was mentioned earlier, higher crop yields leads to a drop in crop prices, so farmers have a harder time to pay back their debts. Their response to diminishing profitability of farming is to just plant more crops since it's the only logical option they perceive, and it creates a cycle of lower prices. In response, farmers get together and create alliances and cooperatives to try and improve their condition. The first one is the National Grange of the Order of Patrons of Husbandry, or the Grange for short. They create cooperatives and built grain elevators to store grain before they sold it, or to hold it in storage until prices increased. The Farmers Alliance were more focused on bringing about political change by creating political parties or lobbying politicians to create legislation that would benefit the farmers. For example, farmers wanted the federal government to regulate the rates that railroads would charge farmers for transporting their crops, since there were virtually no other options for transportation and railroad monopolies could raise the prices as they pleased. The next key concept says the migration that accompanied industrialization transformed both urban and rural areas of the United States and caused dramatic social and cultural change. This period sees a dramatic size in cities. This is where immigrants were settling, but it's also where people that were living in rural areas are now going to find wage labor. The population is growing faster than the infrastructure can really handle at this time and creates crowded and unsanitary conditions for those who live in cities. Tenements were the typical housing accommodation that was similar to an apartment building, but was designed to maximize the amount of units at the expense of bathrooms or ventilation. In tenements, city dwellers would pack anywhere from 6 to 10 people in one small room. Jacob Rees, who was an early reformer, wrote a book called How the Other Half Lives, which details the sordid conditions in the cities. In addition to the book, he includes photographs and illustrations of what the conditions were like in New York City. The two pictures on the screen of the alleyway and the tenement apartments are from Rees's book. The rural migrations that were taking place were to frontier territory, and they were made easier to access by the construction of railroads. The frontier was defined as the limit of settled land, and as a result of westward migrations, the 1890 census no longer considered the frontier a region where it would count the people. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, even the most remote areas had been settled with cities and towns. This leads to Frederick Jackson Turner, a historian and social commentator, to write his thesis on the frontier. His belief was that the frontier had been a defining feature of American culture. It was the source of innovation for Americans as they were forced to find new ways to continue to move west and contend with the challenges of the wilderness they encountered. It offered a place where new opportunities could be found, regardless of one's background. Therefore, American identity was closely tied to the existence of the frontier. But now the frontier, by the census' own tabulation, had been settled to the point that it no longer existed. A chapter of American history had ended without much clue on what the next one would look like. There are some obvious omissions in Turner's thesis. Mainly, it discounts that American Indians had been living in the frontier for centuries. The next key concept is international internal migration increased urban populations and fostered the growth of a new urban culture. 
International migration in this period often referred to as the second wave of immigration. The first one had happened in the middle of the 19th century and was characterized by German and Irish immigrants. Irish and German migrations to the U.S. continued into the late 19th century at high levels, but a new wave made up of Southern and Eastern Europeans settling on the East Coast characterized the second wave. Italians, Greeks, and then Russian Jews who are escaping pogroms in Eastern Europe settle mostly in cities. Their concentration in one place, generally in crowded and dirty conditions, leads to a new wave of nativism. Social Darwinist ideas take hold and nativists begin to lobby Congress for restrictive immigration laws. Immigration centers like Ellis Island were actually constructed to enforce the new immigration restrictions, which by themselves did not slow down the amounts of migrants coming into the U.S. Until 1921, almost all able-bodied adults from Europe or the Western Hemisphere could migrate to the U.S. without serious problems. The same is not so for immigrants from China. Chinese migrants worked on railroads and mines in the West Coast. They mostly traveled to the U.S. on a temporary basis with labor contracts spanning just a few years. They experience nativism because they are perceived to be taking jobs away from white Americans. Californians lobby the federal government and in 1882, Congress passes the Chinese Exclusion Act. This bars any new migration from China to the United States and prohibits any current Chinese migrant in the United States to become a naturalized citizen. As mentioned earlier, Ellis Island operated as a migrant processing center and was opened in 1892 to replace the previous one that was located on Manhattan Island. On the West Coast, a similar processing center is opened at Angel Island in the San Francisco Bay Area in the next historical period. The next key concept says, larger numbers of migrants move to the West in search of land and economic opportunity, frequently provoking competition and violent conflict. Homesteaders were those who took advantage of the Homestead Act of 1862. They received 160 acres of federal land and would have a clear title to it if they stayed on the land and improved it for five years. Since it was passed in the midst of the Civil War, the law disqualified anyone who had taken up arms against the United States, allowing mostly Northerners to take advantage of it. However, the quality of land that homesteaders received wasn't great. Good land with plenty of rainfall, access to waterways, or transportation routes were usually owned by speculators and railroad companies. Most people who were homesteaders failed within the five-year period. They either went on to buy land from a speculator, or they moved to a different urban area. Railroads and mining made migrations within the U.S. possible. Towns sprang up along the railroad lines near stations, or they would spring up around mineral deposits. Boom towns arose out of nowhere, and once the mineral deposits had all been extracted or mined, the boom town would become a ghost town. Ironically, the people who gained the most wealth once gold or silver was found were not the miners themselves. It was all the business people that worked in the towns that served the needs of the miners. For that reason, some boom towns continued to thrive even after the mineral deposits were gone. The modern-day cities of Denver and Reno are examples of those boom towns that didn't become ghost towns. As more settlers moved west, conflicts with natives become more frequent. The Plains tribes that the U.S. was most frequently in conflict with during this period was the Sioux, which consists of the Dakota and the Lakota nations. Early in the period when the U.S. Army confronted the Sioux, they did not have a clear military advantage and experienced significant losses as they did in the Battle of Little Bighorn, where Sioux warrior Crazy Horse led an ambush of General George Custer's troops. However, the growth in the railroads reached west made the U.S. Army more mobile and helped keep it well supplied. The new weapon technologies developed during the Civil War also made them more deadly. The U.S. Army is eventually successful in restricting the Sioux and other tribes further west, like the Nez Perce, to reservations through a series of treaties. The treaties are not always upheld, especially when gold deposits are found on reservation land, as it was in the Black Hills. Eventually, in an effort to assimilate Native Americans, Congress passed the Dawes Act, which forced private property ownership onto Natives. It split up all of the reservation land into individual plots, and then distributed them among the heads of households. The remaining land was then sold to white settlers, and the profits from those land sales were used to fund assimilation schools and yearly rations that were promised to each tribe. The next key concept says, The Gilded Age produced new cultural and intellectual movements, public reform efforts, and political debates over economic and social policies. Intellectual movements were diverse in this period. Social Darwinism, developed by Herbert Spencer, took ideas from Charles Darwin and his theory of evolution that had been published in the 1860s and applied it to humans and society. It's from Social Darwinists that the phrase survival of the fittest actually originates. It was often used to justify discrimination, nativist policies, or opposing public assistance because Social Darwinists did not think it worth to help inferior people or races. Booker T. Washington, who was a civil rights advocate, proposed a pragmatic approach to attaining civil rights and equality for black Americans. 
In his Atlanta Compromise speech, he tries to convince African Americans to accept the discrimination and segregation they experience and focus on attaining economic mobility. He asks them to start with a trade education and then move up from there. The founding of the Tuskegee Institute provided such opportunities. And because his message excused racist policies, Washington was accepted by white politicians and reformers. Public reforms also varied. As the industrial growth starts to impact the environment, the conservation movement begins to advocate the protection of natural spaces. The first national park, Yellowstone, is established in 1872. The Gospel of Wealth was proposed by Andrew Carnegie, the founder of U.S. Steel. He believed that rich, wealthy people should give away part of their wealth to those who need it through philanthropic endeavors. Carnegie donated millions of dollars to build libraries, performance halls, and even a university. The social gospel was a movement that wanted to apply Protestant ideas to help people who are in need, and the movement that carries over from the 19th century include women's suffrage and temperance. The National American Women's Suffrage Association is established by leaders like Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Carrie Chapman Catt. The Women's Christian Temperance Union was founded in 1874 and grew its membership under the leadership of Frances Willard. The new political and economic debates of the time period include the rise of populism. We'll talk more extensively about them later, but their party ideals revolve heavily around the issue of money and inflationary policies like coining silver and using greenbacks. The next key concept says, new cultural and intellectual movements both buttressed and challenged the social order of the Gilded Age. Cultural movements include the growth of popular culture. The rise of the press and newspaper circulation exposes a larger audience to the same news and events. Sports like baseball and college football rise in popularity as spectator sports. Americans begin to use their disposable income to attend attractions like Barnum and Bailey Circus and Buffalo Bill's Wild West. Buffalo Bill's was a large variety show which took elements of Native American life in the West and it popularized the idea of the Wild West that solidified the image that Americans conjure when they think of Native Americans today. For architecture, the most famous American architect, Frank Lloyd Wright, begins his career in this period. He and other architects begin to develop a distinctly American style of architecture called Prairie Style. In literature, there are various styles that become popular. Those are realism and naturalism. Mark Twain, who actually coins the term Gilded Age, is a great example of these realist writers. And Jack London, who wrote novels like Hatchet and White Fang, is a really good example of the naturalist writers. As part of literature, reformers wrote their appeals for change, as did Helen Hunt Jackson in her book, A Century of Dishonor. She detailed how the United States government has treated Native Americans poorly for the past 100 years and advocates for a change of policy. Sadly, her solution that she proposes would be more like the policy of assimilation that would strip Native Americans of their culture. For intellectual movements, writers look for ways to solve new problems that arise during the Gilded Age. Progress and Poverty, written by Henry George, talks about how the cities and the current economic system continue to create a larger rift between the rich and the poor. The assimilation movement in this period was directed towards Native Americans. Indian schools, like Carlisle Industrial School, were meant to assimilate Native American children to become white citizens. It was started by Richard Henry Pratt, a U.S. Army veteran who summarized his goal in the following way, kill the Indian in him and save the man. Finally, the last key concept says dramatic social changes in the period inspired political debates over citizenship, corruption, and the proper relationship between business and government. Segregation established by Jim Crow laws from the previous historical period are still in effect through all of the South and in some parts of the North. In this historical period, a Supreme Court case, Plessy v. Ferguson, upholds segregation as constitutional under the principle of separate but equal. Supreme Court Justice John Marshall Harlan was the lone dissenting judge. He had opposed the outcome of the civil rights cases from the previous period, which weakened the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. Here, he opposes Plessy v. Ferguson and says the following in his dissenting opinion. Everyone knows that the statute in question had its origin and the purpose, not so much to exclude white people from railroad cars occupied by blacks, as to exclude colored people from coaches occupied by or assigned to white persons. The thing to accomplish was under the guise of giving equal accommodation for whites and blacks to compel the latter to keep to themselves while traveling in railroad passenger coaches. No one would be so wanting in candor as to assert the contrary. He was calling this policy of separate but equal racist. He said that it was very clear what the intention of the original law was and that to try to deny it would be to try and fool oneself. Debates over immigration and nativism continue through this period. The debate centers around how long migrants should stay in the United States before they can become naturalized. The outcome of the debate could have political repercussions because it determines how long they have to wait before they can vote. When the key concept refers to corruption, it's almost certainly talking about political machines. 
They started to operate in the previous period, but grow in influence in this period. The most famous one is Tammany Hall in New York. There are movements for reforming these political machines for them to have less power and appointing patronage jobs. Only after President Garfield is assassinated by a job seeker does this law get passed, and it takes power away from political party bosses. The bureaucracy then becomes more of a meritocracy. During this period, industrialists and some in government argued that the federal government should adopt a laissez-faire approach to the economy. This means that the government does not involve itself in the economy or try to influence it in any way through regulation. In reality, the government only took a laissez-faire approach in the lack of oversight it exercised on corporations. The subsidies and government contracts it issued and the strike-breaking activities suggest that the government was actually heavily involved in the economy when it was convenient to big business. Alright, that was a very long lecture and this historical period itself is going to be long, but here is the recap of everything that happened. The economy quickly expanded due to technological innovations and it created a class of mega-rich captains of industry. The debates over the economy dominated labor unions and the new political parties. Immigration from abroad and rural areas grew the size and importance of cities. Expansion into the West brought on conflicts with natives. Diverse intellectual and cultural movements dominate with increased communication. And finally, reform efforts continue over segregation, women's suffrage, temperance, and corruption in government. Thank you for watching. If you would like to watch the next lecture, you can click on the video link on the screen. And if you're looking for more practice to help you on the AP exam, you can visit apushlights.com. I wish you the very best in all of your studying and look forward to seeing you back on the next lecture.